communicate via chat, do that. Uh, also, as you're entering, make sure you're on mute, although Vanessa might be muting you automatically anyway. Um, but if you want to chime in, I don't have any problem with folks, you know, interrupting and just taking themselves off mute. Um, we'll definitely be opening up to discussions towards the end anyway, so we'll welcome that. Uh, at this point, I wanted to pause on this in terms of, um, we didn't really figure out a great way to do attendance like we usually do. So <laughs> I think what, um, yeah. You're gonna get, we're gonna pull your attendance from Delaney. Okay, okay, excellent. Okay, well, before I go to the next slide, um, for those of you who might not already be part of the working group, uh, I just wanted to say a few things. If you didn't see the, the NIMFWA larger members uh, working group introductions, really we are a group of volunteers who are trying to help raise awareness, facilitate information exchange, collaborate among members. Um, climate change is such a huge uh, evolving and uh, complex topic. And so it's very easy to get overwhelmed and, and especially in the context of uh, DOD and mission support. So this is the place where we're hoping to help uh, folks collaborate. And I just had something pop up, that was strange. I'm assuming you're not seeing pop-ups on my screen though there. All right. Um, and I would really encourage you if you're not a member to check out the website. So you have the larger.org website and then go into the working groups, the climate change working group, you'll see the charter there. Uh, normally we're required in fact to have the charter on site when we have our annual meeting in person. So definitely check that out. And then we're also slowly updating the website. So there's some great links to resources, our newsletter and things like that. Uh, who we are. So right now, I, I'm Christy Wolf. I work for the Navy, NAVFAC Southwest as a, at the installation level for Naval Weapons Station Seal Beach Detachment Fallbrook. And then uh, Charlie Lawton. Charlie, are you online? I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi there, everybody. This is Charlie Lawton. I'm the uh, Natural Resources, Cultural Resources, and NEPA manager at Schriever Air Force Base outside of Colorado Springs. And then our immediate past co-chair is Linda Brown. I don't know if Linda's online, but uh, Linda is, so our officers are made up of the immediate past co-chair, the current co-chairs, and then we have a recording secretary. So Linda's the immediate past co-chair at the end of this NIMFWA. Um, Charlie will be our next immediate past co-chair, and then we'll have an incoming uh, chair, Dr. Mindy Clark. Mindy, are you online? Is Mindy, you're currently muted though. <laughs> so, so many buttons to push to unmute. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll start my video so people, you got a picture of me, but um, apparently it's not gonna let me start. Oh, there we go. Um, hi, I'm Mindy Clark. I'm in Colorado as well um, at the Center for Environmental Management and Military Lands. Thanks, Mindy. Thanks. And Vanessa, who's online, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Vanessa Schoblock. Uh, I am at NAFAC Southwest, and I work a lot with Christy, which is why uh, we're kind of in this together. So excited about this meeting. And I put down there, our membership is around uh, 240. It kind of comes and goes every day. If you are interested in becoming a member, there is a uh, button to join on the website itself. If you go through that way, it's way more helpful than uh, emailing us individually. But the Climate Change Working Group started actually way back in about 2010 uh, by Dr. John Lawson and Laura Muse. Um, it has since transitioned through several past co-chairs, Charlie Bond, Janet Johnson, Kevin Dubois, um, and has steadily grown from you know a 
10 members up to 240 and climbing. For the working group annual meeting, uh, I, we want to just kind of get business out of the way. We just had our elections, as I mentioned. Mindy is our incoming co-chair. We don't have any new appointments. Uh, we have, did I skip a slide? I feel like there is a, nope, I just put them in a different order. Um, and I wanted to, kind of take a moment to uh, share with everyone some of the climate change policy regulatory drivers that are newer. Uh, as most of you are familiar, there's, there had been uh, over the past few years, uh, a lot of regulatory rollbacks of Obama era executive orders on climate change preparedness, energy independence and resilience. Uh, but we have a new spate of executive orders and uh, two on the top that I have listed here, tackling climate crisis at home and abroad, protecting public health and the environment and restoring science to tackle the climate crisis. But I would like to say too, like the DOD, unlike other federal agencies has been fairly steady in terms of, you know, the official posture on protecting national security and recognizing climate change as a threat multiplier. Uh, last year's uh, National Defense Authorization Act, for example, uh, was to amend the unified facilities criteria. Is it UFC, is it criteria unified? Anyway, to promote military installation resilience, energy resilience, energy and climate resiliency and cyber resilience. Uh, the fiscal year 21 National Defense Authorization Act also has no later than February 1st of 2022, the SECTF shall submit to the committees of armed services of the Senate and House of Representatives an update to the DOD 2014 adaptation roadmap. Um, so there's, there's a lot of initiative out there and this is definitely a time to, to uh, kind of lean into policies as they start unfolding and seeing how we can best make changes for our installations. The, yeah, the Inspector General Annual Report, there's also been, even the, the Government Accountability Office, there's been a lot of stuff behind the scenes, if you will, that have absolutely encouraged resiliency in the DOD. With respect to the working group, we, uh, <laughs> we hosted at the last NIMFWA a training workshop on the first day. We had technical presentation session, our annual meeting, but for those of you who were present in Omaha, the second training opportunity was canceled on the last day on Friday because of COVID. That was kind of when everything sort of hit and it actually kind of caught NIMFWA right in the middle there. Uh, we brought that second day of training back. And so on the last bullet there, a huge thank you to NIACS, the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science. They did our training yesterday. Um, and then we also, since I'm on the last bullet, um, we'll have our se technical session presenters, Michelle Richards and Paul Brown, which we'll dovetail into right after this. In 2020, we had another uh, newsletter issue published. Uh, the theme of it this time, because of COVID, we were sort of uh, inspired by the challenges of invasive species in, in, in infectious disease and vectors in the context of global climate change. And so that's the theme. We try to kind of have a theme for each newsletter because the topic of climate change is so large. Uh, our website, we've also been uh, chipping away at adding. We put our meeting minutes on there. Uh, we've got links to resources. Uh, We've sent out email blasts for training opportunity, news, research articles. And I will, I, I have this later in a slide, but I will say it's super helpful when people also 
will just shoot things my way or to the whoever's the committee chair in terms of training opportunities, job opportunities, research articles that might be specifically relevant to the DOD, any policy notifications. Uh, this committee, because we're made up of volunteers, we no one is 100% devoted to always keeping our finger on the pulse. So this is a great opportunity to sort of provide a conduit. And just let us know, we try not to spam people's emails too much. Christy, really quick, that dovetails with a great question that we have uh, on the chat. How do we best stay up to date with all of these changes as they come down? Um, because there will be new and good stuff happening regularly and quickly, uh, especially as things evolve. Do you have a, a good answer to that beyond, you know, just sending things out to the committee <laughs> and we can do blast or anything? Yeah, else? yeah. So I switched to the last slide, which is collaborative opportunities. And I think this is raising kind of the same question we have. Um, how to best facilitate? I think, um, you know, Vanessa and I have talked about this in terms of the website. That's not, it's, it's great for uh, links to more information. Um, and I think there's opportunities to uh, provide resources down the road in terms of more uh, documents and sharing and things like that. I, I'm open to suggestions. Uh, I definitely, try to minimize how much we send out because I get things in and I kind of hold on to it until I have two or three, you know, so I'm not constantly, uh, everybody gets bombarded with emails. So I think I did about two to three emails a month. Um, and uh, I don't know if that's helpful, but it is, I see Mich <laughs> my, uh, Michelle says we have a blog but we, we were talking about that and this is, this is good to open up. I don't know enough about uh, managing blogs, but Vanessa, did you wanna, I was a little concerned that that, I don't know how useful that would be for this kind of information feedback. I like the idea of a, a whiteboard type of situation I kind of like a Reddit ask where people could throw a topic out there, you know, or a question or, you know, hey, here, you know, an announcement, and then people can comment and share like in a in sub uh, chats. Charlie raised his hand. So I, uh, I can save um, having having once written a blog um, for my uh, notional uh, personal entertainment, um, keeping them updated is so much work um and it, people i mean it, we all i mean it, it slips off the radar if there's less than you know probably five to six posts a week um it, if you're not all in on a blog you don't have a blog yeah yeah so i i don't have the answers for that but i will say we really do need to, I think, step up our game in terms of engagements. And if there's any interested volunteers or folks in our working group community that would like to, see Mindy says, has anyone used Slack? Um, I have not, <laughs> um, but I'm sure lots of other people have. Definitely reach out to us afterwards. I think there's opportunities here for figuring out some, yeah, Facebook, Charlie mentioned. Um, the thing that limit to on the blog is that while um, you can get permissions and access to the blog, if you come to us and are interested, um, the, the actual editability of that is linked and, and set by the administrator, the website administrator. So there's that to consider. Um, so Christy, as you said, if there's someone who's interested in maybe helping maintain a blog, that could be good. But we've found, I think that email blasts seem to be almost the most effective as opposed to having to email blast, go check out our blog. We usually just send that information out. And we might say, this is also in our blog if you need to refer to it. But we tend to use email as the most um, universal means of communication with our members 
because it's the easiest thing to use when the DOD. And email blasts are great, but they're definitely one directional. You know, we send it out and sometimes I'll get, you know, thank yous or certain things back, but it's not the same as um, I, over the course of the last year, I'll, cert, I'll field an email about, um, you know, do you know anyone who's doing this? Or do you know of resources about that topic? And that's the kind of thing where um, it would be nice to, I don't, yeah, I don't know the best. I don't want to just like constantly send those out as emails. So thanks, David Jones. Um, so the, I, I think we'll leave it at that with respect to if, if there's people who are interested, we're, we're definitely, I think, receptive to uh, developing a committee. If someone wants to be on a chair committee for how best to engage and facilitate that level of exchange, that is a big objective of this working group. So at this point, I see we need to figure that one out a little better. Uh, one of the things that we did stand up a couple of years ago now was the Climate Core newsletter. Uh, we kind of, <laughs> we bit off a lot in terms of the, the format and content. And so we don't get that many out. We kind of traded um, quality for quantity. Uh, so we have three issues out and you can take a look at our at the website for links to those. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we try and target each newsletter has a different theme. So the first one was wildland fire. The second one was sea level rise and inundation. And then the last one was invasive species infectious disease and vectors. Um, the next theme considerations that we're looking at is greenhouse gases, global temperature. Uh, I definitely was interested in tackling that one because it, it can be a very complex science and I think it would be kind of fun to try and uh, demystify some of that and get some information out there. Um, but we're certainly interested in other theme suggestions. And most importantly, we have a section in the newsletter that I think is a really great opportunity for to spotlight initiatives that people are doing in the DOD. So we've had, if you take a look at the newsletter in the DOD spotlight, com community spotlight, you'll see what colleagues are doing uh, in the, we've generally had it be in the context of the newsletter theme, but we don't need to stick to that format. I think the DOD spotlight should really be if anyone has a, a project or, or um, program that they would like to highlight, we can all learn from regardless of whatever the theme is. Um, sorry, I'm looking at two, at two different things here. I'll open it up. There's the last two bullets. We're just sort of looking ahead at NIMFWA 22. We're always looking for suggestions, people who might be interested in um, certain training opportunities. Definitely give us feedback for those of you who have participated in the training in terms of uh, potential speakers. Uh, we're happy to reach out to people uh, if, there are, if there are organizations or speakers you would like to see, um, or if you want to give a presentation yourself. So there's some good conversations in the chat. I haven't been following everything. Vanessa, have you? Following yeah, so uh, William Chapel, and forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. There's a lot of climate change stuff coming down the pipe from OASD uh, to Congress, GAO, CEQ, in response to new executive orders and NDA. Uh, does this group provide any input to these efforts? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, we follow them. We're very much the, you know, on the periphery and and a voyeur, I guess. And that um, I I have only infrequently been asked to uh, weigh in on, you know, policies and things like that. But 
and it's and I do think that yeah well I'll leave it at that thanks Bill So any other, does, if folks want to take off their uh, their mute button, if you have any questions too, we can, <laughs> Scott, <laughs> um, instead of William. Um, we have about six minutes before we'll transition to the discussion, hopefully, Everybody who's going to be joining the discussion had an opportunity to listen to and watch the two presentations that were pre-recorded. And we'll go ahead and we'll present a very uh, brief reminder as to what those were about. Uh, but we have a nice amount of time for that. OK, Brian. IUCN has list serves that function as email format, but also that also chat communities. That could be that could be very interesting. We should check that out. I don't know if anyone else is familiar with the but the IUCN International Union of Concert uh, uh, IUCN International Union of Concerned. <laughs> Conservation Network, I, <laughs> Michelle is asking. Hey, Christy, can you hear me? Oh, barely. Oh, this is Aylin Pierce. I have a question about that EO that you were talking about. Um, do you know what role that your working group will have in terms of answering some of the data questions or data call, or call for information on that or call for action as regards to that EO? So I'm not totally sure I could hear that, but so you're asking about the executive order and or orders and data calls for supporting uh, response to those, like the, um, at this point, I honestly, I'm not super familiar. I did review the executive orders, but only briefly. I'm honestly not sure what data calls might be getting generated. So I'm not entirely sure um, what, how to answer that. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Well, what I what I meant to ask was what what um, role you think the the climate working group here could have a role in answering some of the call to action on that EO. Okay, okay. What role does climate change or could the climate change working group have in terms of uh, helping respond to that call to action? Okay, thanks. Right. But, yeah, got it. Sorry, it is a little hard to hear, but I. I'd like to think that we could really facilitate. So we have a wealth of information out there, at least in terms of the nexus with mission, natural resources, and the challenges ahead. And not necessarily answers, but we can, we can help by identifying the risks that uh, a lot of times I, I I don't know what other installations are, um, how prepared you know they feel, but I can certainly say uh, our public works folks are so racked and stacked with the here and now and the day to day. It's extremely difficult for them to to look five years down the road, let alone you know fifteen and twenty years down the road. And so, one of the things that I'm continually doing is just trying to get people to even look at uh, what are the future potential risks and vulnerabilities to the mission every time uh, every time they're doing a new project. Um, and those are the kinds of things, you know, when they're talking about hardening of assets or building in resiliency, it's not just natural resource resiliency, it's for mission assets and structures and uh, 
training opportunities and what have you. And that I think is really hugely invaluable because a lot of a lot of the people powers that be, if you will, or who are in positions of authority and responsibility, they don't see things the same way. And just sometimes, uh, just sometimes showing them where they have vulnerabilities, it can change the, the dialogue. And Christy, uh, we did have Ryan Orndorf weigh in. Uh, he identified that OSC OASD is establishing a team to develop the climate action plan required by the executive order and any requests for data will be through the military department chain of command. Thank you, Ryan. Yes. We'll be very interested in we'll be very interested in following that team and anything we can do to help. Hey, Christy, this is Mike. I, I just want to put a plug out there that the working group, if they identify anything in particular associated with an executive order or, or other legal document that's coming out for review, they can always promote up to the NIMFWA Government Affairs Committee any concerns they want the committee to take for action. So, yes, I, I you know, that is not an avenue we've used before, but I appreciate what you're saying that we, that was my reminder that 930, that we have the larger NIMFWA organization, obviously. All right. So that was my timer, my reminder that we have to, that we're switching gears now to the presentations. Are there any last minute nickels though before we switch? I'm gonna go ahead and change my screen real quick. While I do this, folks can weigh in. Try it this way. To do it the only way I know how. So I'll go, what I'll do is, uh, I'll do Michelle's first. And Michelle, if you are, do you have audio, Michelle? Can you hear me? Yes, excellent. Oh, great. <laughs> Can you just give like a, a brief few minutes? I have your two slides up and just talk about what you presented. Sure. Um, <laughs> I should have went back and looked at it again. Um, so we talked about, um, interestingly, uh, Michigan Army National Guard was chosen um, back in 2014. Um, 14, to represent Big Army as the service branch uh, pilot project for climate adaptation planning. Um, and uh, we went up against the big dogs at active duty installations uh, and were chosen because we had um, a lot, we already had a baseline of um, the interested stakeholder groups that um, OSD was looking for. And um, it was called the Michigan Climate Coalition. And we uh, jumped on the opportunity to, to do that, uh, knowing that we already had some of those things in place. Um, the crux of my presentation is that not everybody has a state that has that level of action occurring yet at this point, because we've been uh, mired in years where we can't say the words climate change, or um, we have issues with leadership who doesn't want to address it, uh, any number of things have gotten in the way of states being able to be proactive in regards to climate change adaptation. So uh, Michigan's been lucky because we've had this undercurrent of rebellious state and uh, federal government workers who have stuck with the actions of trying to develop a statewide working team to do as much as we can to uh, address mostly adaptation, though there has been um, some mitigation pieces that have fallen into our laps as well. And now that we have a, a governor who believes in climate change and is concerned about it, and um, she's appointed a, I, it's not, this is not the official title, but she's a climate change czar. And we're uh, busting open the mitigation plans for our state again, which is in case you're not familiar with the language, I'll say mitigation is reducing carbon emissions and adaptation is preparing for the effects of climate change. Um, so we're lucky that we've got a two track approach here in our state. Um, we have um, 
Michigan Army National Guard has planned for climate adaptation at both of our installations, Camp Grayling and Fort Custer Training Center. Um, and we continue to try to do more. That adaptation plan was separate from putting uh, climate adaptation uh, management protocols inside of our in ramps. Um, Fort Custer, because I'm there, had a little bit of an advantage because I was um, hell bent on making sure that got my in ramp. Um, so we have uh, addressed four primary concerns in our in ramp, um, and we intend to take on more each year. Uh, the first four were prescribed fire, invasive species. Uh, yep, I have this all memorized somewhere in there. But um, we did some work with Gleesa with scenario planning, uh, Great Lakes Integrated Science and um, Assessment Centers. Everybody has one of those. Um, I won't go over the whole presentation, but uh, suffice it to say, we've got uh, a lot of data already on our side. We have. Uh, dynamically downscale, downscale climate data in our state. So that helps us plan better. Um, we did even more dynamic downscaling of data for Custer because we wanted to know uh, as closely as possible what impacts we were going to see so we could most uh, judiciously manage our high quality natural communities. And uh, we have the philosophy of taking it from those high quality natural communities out because we also have a matrix, which one of my colleagues said, you can't call it crap but well, it's crap. Um, it's you know lots of black locust and uh, things that are not native species uh, in the matrix. And um, while we, I guess we're going to change the names of those to novel ecosystems, um, while we will continue to see what happens in those, we're managing from those core habitats, hoping that those can be seed sources and uh, wildlife sources for times when we have an opportunity to restore population anything uh, and yeah I, I, did you put the second slide into Christy I don't I did know. I was kind of uh hold on a second that is not working there we go uh and so you know the sum summation which you know that summation was kind of scattershot um partners are everything like I said we've already have uh we're lucky in Michigan to have that many partners already attached to one another and doing work for many years um, and if you don't have them and you need help figuring out who might be your ally in managing this process, uh, hit, hit me up. My email's on the people page. Um, I, uh, if you don't get me via email and I'm not responding, hit me up via text, right, Christy? <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, perfection is not the point. Uh, adaptive planning is. Uh, we, we always talk about uncertainty, and in this field, uncertainty is exactly what we're dealing with all the time. That doesn't mean we shouldn't act. It means we have to act on the best possible data that we have in our hands at the time. And then we can move from there and try to do better and reassess each year and see if we're doing better. Um, every state, as I mentioned earlier, has the Regional Integrated Science and Assessment Center. It's, uh, it covers several states, each one. They're out of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And each of those organizations is trying really hard to create data that works for their partners to do what they need to do uh, to plan for adaptation. And you already mentioned NIACs, they're here, they were here earlier, but they're also willing to travel. And if you need some help, they are a great resource because they can help you get your arms around this very complicated problem and at least focus in places where you might be able to make a difference. Um, and they give you good data to do that with as well. Um, now my last tidbit of wisdom, I've spent so much time in uh, climate adaptation workshops, uh, presentations, and I see all of these uh, scientists using, you know, well, we're going to use the midpoint scenario, or we're going to use the low emission scenario. And I think to myself, you're crazy. Uh, at this point, you know, and not to get political, but the Biden administration is actually going to start to address the issues of um, carbon emissions, but we're, it's going to take some time and political will to start reducing carbon emissions. And if you're planning, I highly recommend you use that highest emission scenario um, because that's gonna give you the worst case scenario and you're gonna be able to plan most uh, effectively. And if you planned too hardcore and you went a little too far, probably the loss is not gonna be great. You'll just be more prepared. Um, so those are my tiny words of wisdom. I'll be quiet because that was probably more minutes than I should have. No, okay. that's great. Thanks. And we do have extra time um, because we did have a 
seeker drop out early on. Um, so we kind of lucked out that way in terms of not being too time bound. Um, but thanks. And then I'm going to go ahead. Is um, Paul Brown on? Yes, I am. Excellent. And Paul, I call you. I've called you Dylan in emails. It sounds like you go by Paul though. Listening to your presentation. <laughs> my apology. No worries, I confused everyone. <laughs> Thank my parents for that. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> All right, can everyone see that? Predicting sea level change at wake a toll. Okay, if you wanna jump to the next slide. So you guys can see, uh, you can all go and watch the pre-recorded content if you wanna see more information, but Generally speaking, uh, sea level rise is something that's very difficult to predict with any degree of accuracy. Uh, it's always kind of a moving target based on what variables you factor into your calculations and your models. Uh, for example, something as simple as the data sets that you use. Uh, I used 1990s topographic data for my analysis, basically for security reasons. Um, so that it's more of a generalized model. Uh, so when you look at uh, specific areas of the island and how you're going to affect infrastructure uh, that isn't taken into account. So there's a lot of little nuances like that when you're looking at any kind of sea level rise data. Uh, you know, it's the garbage in, garbage out kind of mantra, but also being able to understand what you're trying to look at. And I was trying to look for a more generalized uh, prediction of what would be the effects. So most climate models are predicting sea level rise somewhere between a half to two meters by the end of the century. Um, there's a lot of data suggesting that that might be closer to 2050, uh, where we're seeing those sea level rises. And then storm surges of six to 10 feet, uh, two to three meters, um, causing potentially significant uh, inundation and flooding. Uh, so the work that I did was looking again at universal or uniform rise, uh, not necessarily specific bathymetric canyon funneling, any kind of bathymetric uh, information that kind of adds to the uh, degree of specificity of the effects. So if you want to go to the next slide. So if we had just a 0.6 meter rise, uh, 60 centimeters, which is kind of the low end. Uh, that's what NASA is predicting is somewhere between 0.4 and 0.6 meters. Um, we would see significant ponding and pooling on wake. Uh, if we went up to 1.5 meters, um, we're gonna lose a great portion of the island. Um, and then the modeling went from, I did everything from 10 centimeters up to 3.3 meters. And so at 3.3 meters, uh, essentially the island's underwater. Uh, so the other thing to take into account with sea level rise and with just general global climate change is that that ch will bring changes to precipitation as well. And we already see time periods where we have large uh, flood events following major rainstorms. And so that would only uh, exacerbate uh, problems. Uh, one thing that we do see out at Wake is a uh, dynamic coastline uh, that's constantly changing. Uh, so there's actually another uh, presentation I've done for NIMFA regarding uh, land change out at the island. And we see a lot of shoreline changes, and that's going to affect how sea level rise affects the island. Um, so the other thing that I think it's really important to mention is sea level rise is kind of a slow motion emergency. And I think because it's so slow motion, it's a chronic issue that a lot of people don't really recognize the significance to areas that are low lying or coastal. Um, this is something that could potentially affect tens of millions of people around the world and places like Wake, which is out in the middle of the Pacific, are extremely vulnerable to these effects. Not only sea level rise, but also coastal inundation. Uh, if we get changes in weather patterns and we get more severe and frequent storms, which is what is predicted, uh, then we start getting acute effects of catastrophic events happening on the island. Uh, so not only just hurricanes, uh, but uh, anything else that's going to affect the area. If you already have a higher sea level, those uh, damaging effects are gonna be even higher. 
And so the the big takeaway message from from what I did though is that I was looking at the consequences of sea level rise or inundations and how it would affect the infrastructure in the island. Uh, I was not trying to make predictions of when this is going to happen or the probability of one thing happening or another. Um, we do have uh, ongoing work right now. I'm actually heading out to Wake this week uh, to go drive a boat for some bathymetric surveys where we're going to be uh, fine tuning some of these uh, predictions and trying to look at what are the probabilities of, of occurrence of some of these situations happening on the island. And then we can start making recommendations of how to mitigate those effects. So that's all I got. Excellent. I'm gonna stop screen sharing and um, really open it up to questions and uh, comments. Or I I have a few questions, but I'm gonna sit on my hands for a minute and let other people jump in either uh, through audio or on the chat. I guess while we're waiting for folks, I'll, I'll ask a couple. I was um, starting with Michelle. I am very interested in the, the RISA, basically, the uh, NOAA's RISA teams. And it's not something that we've engaged with as much where I am, at least um, I, sh I don't want to speak for our whole region, but um, <laughs> Let's see, where's my question here? Um, in terms of tapping into subject matter expertise for your questions of interest, I mean, that always seems to be a challenge to get these other larger agencies, uh, unless you're ponying up a lot of money and saying, you know, here, can you, <laughs> can you study this? Or can, you know, what, what have they specifically been able to provide and how, how's your experience been? hitting all the right buttons. Um, so uh, ours is really active and I I wish I knew a little bit more about the other regional ones. They are, um, they haven't asked for much. I, um, I offered funding for what I was asking them to do, not a lot, um, to do some of the downscaling. Um, and Michigan's weird because uh, we have the Great Lakes surrounding us and um, it presents a challenge that cannot simply be captured in the global climate change modeling data. So in order to get that applicable um, data for our funky little area, and it, you know, yeah, maybe you've heard of lake effects. No, maybe you haven't, but if you live here, you sure have. Um, those kind of crazy things. Uh, it's, it's, it's critical to do the dynamical downscaling and not everyone can do that. You can do statistical downscaling in other places where it's not as complicated and you'll still get the right amount of data. Um, they have a meeting, they, there's, so there's the National Adaptation Forum, which you may or may not be familiar with. Um, and the, the, the local rises do every other year. So National Adaptation Forum happens one year, uh, the local adaptation forum happens the other year. And um, ours has, helped farmers uh, do downscale data to determine if the cherry blossoms are going to get whacked and what they can do to help prevent the agricultural issues that are facing them. Um, they generally don't, they get funded, they get federal funding. It's a research-based organization. It's NOAA in partnership with universities. For us, it's University of Michigan and Michigan State University. And so they have experts from all different parts of climate change, where, whether it's the actual crunching of the data, um, whether it's the predictions of lake levels or impacts on society or networks of like how, how do you disperse information amongst people uh, in order to get word out about climate change impacts. So uh, I, I'm going to guess that the other regions have similar things and that they all get a good chunk of funding and they're there to serve you. Um, I don't you, like I said, we offered because I knew what I was asking of them was a relatively big effort. If it was just the downscaling of data, they almost owe it to you to do that because the feds are already paying the bill. Does that answer the question? Uh oh, can't hear you. Are you muted? <laughs> I was. <laughs> Good thing you didn't let me go on too long. <laughs> um, so it's definitely helpful when installations don't have to try and pony up the money to get help. And 
and certainly on regional levels where we have maybe similar ecosystems or maybe similar coastal challenges, that's where um, I, I can see you know, potential real resource there. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll certainly be looking into that more. That was, that was good to learn about. Army Corps has some new stuff that they put out too that is um, some vulnerability assessment. I, I've looked at it briefly for our region and it, it, you know, because they're doing it on a national scale and not a regional understanding of the, the specific issues, it's not quite as robust as what I found that, that out of the Reese's. So, um, yeah, I, it's a good resource. I think that you would probably be surprised at how much information you can get out of them without spending a dime. <laughs> yeah, and, and the scaling aspect, I think, is it, it's so important not to underestimate, overestimate. Um, when you have like national, uh, sorry, my computer, uh, national models, it <laughs> there's going to be a lot of problems trying to apply it locally. And, and I'll, I think that's one of the bigger challenges when you're at, you know, you're in your silo at an installation and you, you're already wearing multiple hats. The last thing you can be is a specialist in how to scale a model. And so, I mean, you're talking about, you know, statistical versus dynamical scaling. And I'm, I'm like, uh, Oh, okay, I have to look that up. Like I don't, you know, I'm. I'll be quite honest. I don't even know exactly the nuances that, in that terminology. Um, but that's where we could all use, you know, tap into SMEs, um, get a little translation and localized uh, support. Now, Christy, um, we did have some questions in Pathable. Okay. Uh, one of them is from Aaron Hebshi. He asked, um, as to Paul. As someone who has seen firsthand storm surges inundating Wake Island, how important are models? How important in the models are storm surges versus just gradual sea level rise? Paul, we can't hear you if you're trying to talk. I'm not sure if he's got his mute on. No, sorry, my uh, internet connection keeps dropping me out of the meeting. So. Um, I'm sorry I missed whatever just happened other than he's yeah. probably on mute. <laughs> so uh, Paul, our question was, um, as someone who has seen firsthand storm surges inundating Wake Island, how important are, in the models are the storm surges versus just gradual sea level rise? So storm surges, well, sea I, level Yep. So I think the, the issue is, um, the slow and gradual rise in sea level versus the shock and awe of storm inundation. So sea level rise uh, is going to affect the infrastructure. It's going to slowly eat away at the shoreline and is slowly going to get closer and closer to the infrastructure and the buildings and the airfield. Uh, storm surge is going to uh, instantaneously affect basically the entirety of the island and they kind of compound one another. So if we had a five foot uh, storm surge, that would be significant. If we had, you know, a half meter sea level rise and then a five foot storm surge on top of that, that storm surge of five feet is going to be that much more destructive because there's less island that it has to move across. So storm surges are functionally, um, you know, going to damage, destroy in a, you know, catastrophic hurricane, uh, typhoon kind of way. Uh, sea level rise is just going to slowly uh, get your feet wet in the buildings. Uh, storm surge is going to take the building off of the island. So they're, they're both pretty important, right? Yeah, the the higher the sea level rise, the more destructive the storm surges would be because there's less and less infrastructure, less and less island to slow the water down as it moves across the island in a storm surge. So what do you plan for? Do you plan for the storm surges? Do you plan for sea level rise or do you plan for both? I think you really realistically have to plan for both. I, there's really nothing in the literature. Uh, it's generally the consensus that there is going to be sea level rise. The issue is just how much and how soon it's going to happen. 
So I think sea level rise is something that you have to uh, take into account and start to think about in planning and how you need to update your infrastructure. And storm surges are something that are a infrequent event, but something that's going to cause catastrophic damagings. So you have to plan for those as well. So when you make new infrastructure, um, you need to plan for the worst of what's potentially going to affect the island or recognize that uh, you know, you're going to have to rebuild after every time. And it's probably cheaper to build best first rather than keep rebuilding. Fair. We also have another question um, for you uh, from Scott. Uh, and he asked, have you been sharing with or using the DOD's uh, DRSL website for SLR data and predictions? Um, yeah, I've looked at that. Um, generally, what I use is uh, NGA, so the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Uh, I get a lot of, I have all of the data that they have from GRID. And um, so I've used a multiple different array of all the available data and then some stuff that we have uh, have available through the Air Force. Um, so we have point cloud data. We have um, 1990s satellite reconnaissance or uh, space shuttle reconnaissance data. Uh, we've got original mapping topographic data from the 1950s marine surveys. So there's all kinds of data available, and I've actually modeled using all of that data. Um, what's presented for NIMFA is based on the 1991 uh, space shuttle reconnaissance uh, radar tomography data. Uh, just because it's a little more generalized, so it's more open source and can be, you know, shared with anyone. Um, but we do have more detailed and fine resolution data that I've done the same efforts on. Um, mostly, the NGA is a clearinghouse for all uh, DoD data sets. So basically, if there's a topographic data set out there, uh, I have a copy and I've used it all. Um, basically, the difference is the amount of resolution and clarity and specificity for each individual area on the island. So, NOAA's got a really good website, too, that shows sea level rise. That's got a, kind of a slider and you can zoom in on an area of the world that's of interest to you. And you can raise the sea level and see what the impacts would be in real time. It's pretty cool. You, so you've... An uh, obviously taking a bunch of different data sources and uncompiled them. Um, so the DRSL, so if, in case people aren't looking at the chat, is the DOD Regional Sea Level Database, which is uh, publicly available and also CAC available. Thanks, uh, Paul. I hope it's Paul. Um, would you have a recommendation for folks who want to do this type of modeling, which database to use, or would you recommend compiling information just as you have? I think if you can go to a single source, it's a lot easier. I was trying to compile and look at differences between the data sets and see if I saw anything different based on the quality of the data that we got. Um, so I think that the um, the website they're mentioning there is a, a great resource for people that don't necessarily, not everyone necessarily has access to NGA data. And so um, it just depends on what you have access available to. I, I personally recommend using the highest quality data with the highest resolution um, that you can get. So if you can get NGA data, I would highly recommend it. If you can't get it, then use what you have available. And um, the, the more information you have, you can always um, reduce resolution, but you can't increase resolution. And we have another question from uh, Ms. Valerie Vartanian. Uh, and this is once again to Paul. They're looking at beach replenishment at Naval Base Ventura County, Ventura, not Ventura County, Naval Base Ventura to enhance our coastline. For example, they've lost about 400 feet of beachfront since the 1940s. So, um, how would Wake build protection? Are you talking about adding fill? Are you talking about you know, are we at the point of talking about sea level dikes? What What's the process here or what are you looking at? What's What's the Air Force looking at for the future? Well, that is a very hard question to answer because there's a lot of different ways to do it. Historically, what has been done for uh, shoreline and beach replenishment is, um, you know, seawalls and uh, kind of perpendicular walls heading out from the beach. And so you get, uh, 
shoreline uh, accretion from the, the sand in that area. Problem with that is you adjust and you change localized uh, current patterns and wake in particular is arguably one of the nicest coral reefs anywhere in the Pacific Ocean. And that's kind of a little fun fact that most people don't know. Uh, when you look at the NOAA data that travels all across uh, the Pacific, uh, Wake has some of the highest coral cover left anywhere on Earth. And so it's a spectacularly pristine area, um, kind of by de facto being a marine protected area for so many years. And so when we, it's also a marine national monument and a national wildlife refuge. And so for us, any of the shoreline mitigations that you could use in, in a lot of other places are not really available to us because that would negatively affect the marine environment. We have endangered corals out at the island and um, some of the healthiest populations of those endangered corals anywhere in the world. And so for us, uh, a lot more of our mitigations will have to be infrastructure based uh, on the land rather than um, coastal uh, modifications. Uh, we can't do things like build a seawall out into the, also the, the island is so steep that by the time you get 600 meters off of shore, you're already in 800 feet of water. So you really can't build a seawall out there because the seawall at the end would be hundreds of feet deep. Um, so there's a lot of the mitigations that are available to someplace uh, in California or Virginia that you could take to um, harden your coastline or protect it from potential impacts. Uh, those just aren't available at Wake. It's more about building stronger buildings uh, uh, or and raising the, the ground level. Well, I was going to say at some point you could go to stilts, right? Um, yeah, so like things like the uh, airfield is just, uh, they're working on raising the airfield a few feet. Uh, you know, those kinds of mitigations would uh, stave the sea level rise, you know, the sea level rises two feet, but you also raise the airfield two feet. Well, then you've solved the problem, at least for the short term. have a lot of other talk going on in the chat, but it looks like people collaborating, which is great. Um, are there any other questions that we have? We don't have a lot of time. It's uh, 10 o'clock. I believe we end at 10? At 10.15. Oh, hey, we have plenty of time. <laughs> Let's see. So Paul, you did just mention, and this is always something I'm, I struggle with. You mentioned that they're talking about raising the uh, airfield two feet or whatever it was, and that that was a projection for sea level rise. Um, one, of the, one of the things I'm always trying to encourage, but it really, it's usually the first thing you get back is it's just too much money, but why not overshoot? Why not try to raise it four feet because you know, I mean, I don't know that, but we have, I'll use a you know case more in terms of inundation locally. You talk about um, flood plains and even the building of structures today, they're still looking at, um, you know, hundred year flood plains. Well, we, you know, we surpassed that in much less than 100 years now. Why are we using those as benchmarks? So I don't know if that's analogous to the sea level rise. I know there's, um, but I think when I think about the um, storm surges and things, uh, the extreme events, um, wouldn't it be better to overshoot? I think that was something that Michelle sort of mentioned too, like, you know, what's the risk? No, you're absolutely right, but you have to think, about wake and where it is. Um, where are you going to get that fill to be able to raise it eight feet? Uh, you know, th or, or whatever the case may be. You know, it is a very low-lying island, precariously perched on top of an underwater volcano, basically a very, very old one. Wake is also one of the oldest atolls anywhere in the Pacific. It's somewhere between 80 and 120 million years old, and it's extremely steep. If it were Above water, it would be the fourth highest mountain in the United States by prominence. 
So it's very tall, very steep. And so there's nowhere to get more land to add to the top. So you'd have to barge it all in. And then how stable is that land going to be? So if you get a huge storm surge coming in, is it just going to rip that right off of the top because it's not really stabilized ground? So the higher you artificially raise that land, the more unstable and the more likely it's going to be negatively affected by a major storm surge. Because we have no way to harden a shoreline or protect those areas, we can't just build a giant yeah. castle wall around a wake. All of those things factor into it. So yes, raising it to some degree is very helpful. If you raise it too much, you actually make yourself more uh, prone to catastrophic damage from a major event. Makes sense. That definitely underscores the complexity. <laughs> Uh, we have uh, another question in the chat. Um, once again, for Paul, there's uh, awareness that there have been rogue waves that can also have impacts on uh, wake atolls, um, but this person isn't sure if there's any new progress in that field of research or any thoughts. So once again, you know, we have storm surges, we have sea level rise, and then you have the possible, you know, cataclysmic event of a, um, a rogue wave. So is there anything being thought of or done via that? Yeah, that's actually one of the things that we're doing in the project that I'm going out to wake for next week. Uh, we mostly get our waves from the north side. And so when we have had major big rogue waves, they basically affect Peel Island up on the north corner of the island um, or the atoll. And you do have some pretty significant damage uh, there that we've had from previous rogue waves. Um, it's something that we're looking into and we're actually doing some oceanographic modeling and wave. Uh, we've got some equipment that's going being deployed out into the ocean for oceanographic data and wave intensity and direction and a bunch of other variables so that we can better understand uh, where our waves are coming from because you can't, again, build a big wall around the island, but we can harden structures that are most likely to be impacted. And so understanding where those waves are likely to be coming from is the first step to be able to understanding what we need to do to mitigate. Um, right now, we think most likely the north side is the most likely place that we're going to get. But understanding that um, canyon funneling and some of the nuances of the bathymetry, that will affect how waves are channeled uh, into the island. And so there is potential that other areas of the island could be impacted in a, in a greater way based on where the waves are coming from and, and what those intensities are. Uh, thank you for that answer. We have a question from Colin Lee. Uh, this was for Michelle and Michelle did answer this in the chat, but I just wanted to highlight it. And Colin asked, um, the Michigan presentation gave examples of implementation and they sound like research and monitoring studies. Can you talk about how you fund these example through in funding requests or partner contribution? And are there carbon sequestration or habitat enhancement implementation goals that you can speak about? Um, Michelle replied, um, DNRs, and Michelle, maybe you could actually tell us what DNRs are, and if you want to reply to sure. the answer, that would be great. Not a do not resuscitate. Um, uh, <laughs> the Department of Natural Resources, uh, everybody's got one, right, or Fish and Game, I know they're different around the country. Um, so we have not uh, secured much funding from other organizations to do the work that we do. Most of it is couched in, we're supposed to be managing these habitats and these species, and uh, in order to do that, we need to fund these projects. So we've done everything from um, assess how climate change is gonna impact the HERP taxa on our installation to looking at um, bird migration patterns. And uh, if birds are coming sooner, are the, is the phenology of their food source matching their arrival? Um, and again, most of that's funded through uh, step projects, or I don't know, every service branch is different, but um, we, as long as it's in our in-ramp and it applies to climate change, we've gotten support. Uh, our leadership is very clear that climate change is going to be one of the most uh, tough factors to manage uh, around when it comes to species. Um, some of the habitat enhancement stuff we've done is uh, prescribed fire invasive species management, 
Um, and we do that with an eye toward moving our systems to a future state, not necessarily uh, the, everybody gets really flipped out. Well, not everybody, some people in these circles get really flipped out by like, we're gonna move a species, right? So instead of us like actually translocating species, we're preparing our habitats to support the species we expect to see coming further north, particularly birds, but other species too. Um, and uh, and in Michigan, we are lucky because uh, a lot of the conditions that we're going to see will be hotter and drier. Rain and uh, precipitation vents on the shoulder seasons in spring and fall, um, and summers will be hot and dry. But most of the habitats in the southern half of our very weird georeference state. Um, will be supporting that which was here historically. Not everybody has the advantage of being able to restore to historic states. So we're, we're headed towards prairies, oak savannas, xeric species that will tolerate that hot dry summer um, and those wet and weird springs and winters or springs and falls. So um, yeah, you can get it funded if you couch it in climate change. And I suspect that's gonna get easier and easier with a new administration and changes in our guidance um, from on high. Well, Christy, you and I were talking about this as well, um, and it was along the lines of funding and funding for analyzing climate change and climate change impacts. Did you want to share a little bit about our conversation? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so we, I mean, what we were talking about uh, veered a little bit into the politics of, you know, and challenges of securing funding. And I will say that every organization or branch in the service is a little different in terms of how they, um, how they prioritize dri drivers for funding. Um, and we, our organization, and I don't know that this is true, especially listening to other people, um, you know, there's certain drivers that just don't carry weight and climate change um, just has never had a very strong driver by itself. Um, but certainly where there's a nexus with something like Endangered Species Act or, um, a strong nexus with mission impacts, but even then it can be challenging unless, you know, the facilities or public works is um, ponying up. Um, uh, so that was kind of the nature of our conversation somewhat, but there are other sources of funding and we certainly have, we have partnered with our public works um, where, there, where there is a joint benefit for sure. Um, there are also other streams of funding, sometimes ag programs, um, uh, uh, grants and things like that. Um, but just packaging for during the, when we're entering a POM cycle for the Navy. Um, I say for the Navy because is POM, POM is DOD wide or uh, this just came up a recent thing. I thought it was more widely used um, in, the, in the government than it is. Um, <clears throat> but things like Migratory Bird Treaty Act or wetlands, or those are not strong drivers. Um, so it's hard to just put in a, a project with those or with climate change. You have to be strategic in how you package things and really look at what are the risks and benefits and make it a strong argument to get that funded. I don't know if that answered your question, Vanessa. Other people are certainly welcome to weigh in. That was only my personal experience. I think that you would find, uh, um, and I can't off the top of my noggin recall where they are, but there are uh, requirements inside of uh, various and sundry pieces of policy that have come down from DOD that require us to plan for climate change. Um, so. Yeah, you can't necessarily just put in a, I'm going to plan for climate change project um, and have it work. But you can say, we expect this species on the uh, American Bird Conservancy list to tank in the next 10 years because blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. We need to do this work in order to prepare for it. So you're right. You do have to sometimes craft it more uh, subtly if your leadership is less inclined to uh, see it as the crisis that it is. Um, 
and that speaks to like the more advocacy we can do as natural resources managers and understanding the uh the, it's an actual crisis as i heard someone on the news last night say uh that it's just as bad as the pandemic if not worse because the long-term impacts are gonna be yeah. awful as we all know so yep. the more advocacy you can do with your leadership the better off you'll be yeah, and and you and you mentioned tying it to a species, which is exactly what you know I've done as well. But it ha you know, but it has to be a federally listed threatened or endangered. I mean, it, it has to have at least today. I mean, I don't know in two years or how things are going to evolve, but from at least my experience, um, the algorithms for prioritizing funding don't necessarily weigh executive orders and it's not that there isn't policy it's not that there isn't um guidance it's just that it doesn't have the a strong driver to I, there are so many you know projects competing you know we have perfectly legitimate you know good wetland conservation money or what have you that doesn't get funded um so but that's that's just going to be a perennial challenge in terms of uh, client, but I think it absolutely can be done, and we have absolutely funded climate change, uh, climate adaptation initiatives, uh, and it's just the way it's just the way we've packaged it. And so, I would just encourage folks to work within their organization who might be savvy with what their uh, higher you know headquarters tends to fund over other things so i just want to point out that the pathable chat has a lot of good uh commentary going on uh tammy Ponkel identified that tom is indeed uh department of defense wide and brian hennen had a comment and i would read his comment except my internet is refreshing um but michelle there was another comment for you there about the 50 to 100 year difference if you wanted to speak to that really quickly before we close. Sure, so I, I tried to answer it in text, but it's probably easier to say it out loud. Um, I shoot for 50 years out and I shoot for 50 years out on the uh, highest emission scenario. Um, that gives, and I don't do the points in between. Um, I feel like it's too complicated to try to plan for in 10 years and in 20 years and in 30 years. Like shooting for 50 years out gives us a solid sense of what we're gonna expect the scenarios are relatively uh, solid and rigorous in that time frame, And then with an eye towards what they're predicting for 100 years out, I see if there's any tweaking that I need to go back and do at the 50 year time frame. Because um, if, you, if you try to do all of the stuff in between, you're gonna get so far down in the weeds that you're gonna be overwhelmed, handcuffed, and incapable of planning for the future. <laughs> and yet one of the loose things that I've been told is plan for in 50 years, the climate 50, 500 miles south of you is what you're probably gonna be able to expect. That's a really loose and really uh, unscientific way to do it, but it does give you a sense of what you might end up be facing in the long run. So can I ask really quickly, are you, so you're looking at a, uh, what's your, when you say 50 years out, what is the time frame around 50, you know, so if we're looking at, you know, 2071, what's the time frame around 2071 that you're looking at? Are you looking at a 50 year average? Or are you looking at a 20 year average? Or are you looking at a 10 year average? Do you know what I'm getting at with the predictions or are you just, or projections, or are you? Uh -oh. It's, <laughs> can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know that, um, the data that we've been handed has not parsed it out in that finite of detail, right? Like, we know, we know that at 50 years out, we can expect anywhere between this level and this level of changes in precip, changes in temperature. Um, and that's actually pretty solid. So on either side of that, like, uh, I, I do get what you're saying. Um, and I, and I think it gets you too far down in the weeds to, again, make those decisions based on uh, trying to adjust it to that time frame. Okay. I was just curious. 
but we can talk about it offline more. Sure, yeah. To... Email me or call me or whatever. I'm happy to chat. I was going to say, don't forget via Pathable that if you have additional questions or want to meet with your presenters, you actually can ask and request to schedule a meeting with them one on one or bring a group. So feel free to use that option. It's under master schedule, schedule meeting. Uh, maybe just message them first and make sure that they're available. Christy, did you want to do anything before we close? Other than thank everybody for joining and for a great conversation. And we have a lot of work ahead. So I look forward to um, more engagement and ideas for how we can really uh, foster good communication and collaborations. I know we're gonna we're gonna get kicked out of here at some point, but um, I don't know, Mindy, did you want to say anything as our incoming chair to put the spot oh, on you? Awesome conversation, and um, I'm really excited to be part of this. And um, you know, one of uh, my goals for my program is to kind of gather all gather together all these sources of information so that they are available to people easily. Like the Risa's, I've been checking them out and ours does just water. So, you know, if you're in the, in the Rocky Mountain, it's not great. The, the Great Lakes one is awesome. And, you know, so, so it is regionally variable and try to figure out how to help everybody get the data they need easily, applic you know, the right data and, um, you know, answer any questions. So I am here and looking forward to participating in that over the next couple of years. Oh, and one more plug um, for Air Force folks. Um, one of the things that uh, we can help with is integrating. It, it, we're uh, helping out with all your in-room needs. And one of the things that we can do is help integrate climate change into your in-rooms. So if you want to get on that list, um, please reach out to me and I would be happy to do that. All right. Well, great. Thanks, everybody. Hey, thanks, everybody. I just got an echo. If there's anything else, I think we're done, though. Is the meeting adjourned officially? It is if you say it is. Our recording secretary. <laughs> All right. Sounds good, everybody. Thanks again. Thank you.